Uh, we are, this is our monthly special education citizens advisory committee meeting. I am your acting chair, Troy Sampson, and we have on the call thus far, we have our vice chair, Sarah Whalen. Raise your hand, Sarah. We have our secretary on, Jamie Alfonso Kumo. Uh, we also have A.O. Bello is on. She's a part of our team as well. And then we have our school team members. We've got Trinelle Bowman on. She is our associate superintendent of special education. Did that, did that title change or are you still the associate superintendent? That's correct. All right. We got Karen Andrews on. She's our coordinating supervisor from the Department of Special Education. We have Marcy Tershawn, who is um, managing our Zoom meeting and does a great job at doing that every month. Uh, she's our program coordinator for the Family Engagement Center. And we have Miss Yvette Young, uh, the marathon runner, who is our social worker and with our Family Support Center. I joke with Yvette because at the Parent Empowerment Conference, she was just running the hallways back and forth. So I call her our marathon runner. I know she got a bunch of steps in. Um, and then we also have our guest speaker today, uh, Noah Perez on who is with the uh, Autism Self-Advocacy Network. He's the Community Engagement Manager, and he's gonna be sharing with us a lot of information about ASAN. And it's the perfect time to learn about Autism Self-Advocacy Network. So he's gonna tell us all about it. He's got the floor tonight. We have also on the call so far, Ms. Rhonda Bullock, uh, who's on the call as well. And so to share with everyone a little bit about what CCAC is, our mission and our purpose, is we want to engage um, the community to participate in the educational process, basically, and we want to make sure that um, that process is to make everyone more knowledgeable and responsible to the unique and multifaceted um, needs of students with disabilities. We want to ensure parents are actively and meaningfully um, involved in the education process. Um, as to our, our purpose also was to advise the Board of Education Superintendent and the Director of Special Education and the community at large of the unneed mets of students with disabilities. We also want to facilitate an effective communication and collaboration between PGCPS, the students, families, and advocates, and other interested community members. We also want to increase awareness to foster respect and encourage acceptance of people with disabilities, both within the school community and the community at large. We also strive to fulfill the intent in the spirit of the laws that defines and protects the rights of individuals with disabilities. And we take requests. We often receive requests from the special uh, director of special education, superintendent board of education and the community at large. And we also will do research and inquiries of concerns and make recommendations or other appropriate responses to the director of special education, um, superintendent board of education and our community in a timely manner. And we also want to provide a forum for countywide citizen input on special education program related services and relevant issues. And so that's what this committee is here <laughs> to do. Um, hopefully we have more people joining us tonight for this informative meeting. And so I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Ms. Trinelle Bowman, who's our Associate Superintendent of the Department of Special Education to give us an update on Special Education Department. All right, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our April meeting. I'm just going to share some uh, Prince George's County Public Schools and special education updates. We'd like to thank our Board of Education members for all they do to support the work of our Department of Special Education. And we also would like to send a greeting to our Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Monica Gosen. So I just want everyone to know, don't forget, we have our Parent Empowerment Conference going on. Uh, we kicked that off uh, last month. You can register at the link that's provided on the PowerPoint. We will be posting the PowerPoint. Um, Marcy also just put the link in the chat. We have several wonderful workshops occurring um, all the way through June 1st. So make sure you take a look at the conferences that are upcoming. And again, we'll be concluding on June 1st. And then we also have three more sessions uh, for our behavior support group, really, where we look at applied behavior analysis to really support our parents with various um, strategies at home. And so our next three sessions, um, the next one will be held on April 27th, focuses on task analysis. On May 25th, it focuses on prompting. And then on June 8th, we'll conclude with generalization and maintenance. Again, that link is also provided 
on this slide. Marcy will put that in the chat for you. And those sessions are from 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is that I had an opportunity to present to the Board of Education on April 13th. They had requested um, specific information regarding our general supervision and monitoring that we do around IEP development, as well as the supports that we provide to students. So when you get an opportunity, you're welcome to take a look at that presentation. It's also archived on the Board of Education's uh, site, so you can actually watch it live if you also choose to do so. Um, I do wanna share um, exciting news. As you know, we are building new schools in Prince George's County Public Schools as part of our blueprint implementation. And so I'm just gonna go through and just give you some updates on the new schools um, and the programs that will be at each of those schools. So for Colin Powell Academy, that's gonna be on the Southern end of our district. Um, for K-8, it's going to be a K-8 academy. So for students in grades kindergarten through eight, we will have an autism program there. Um, I do want to note that for the 23-24 school year, we will only be opening grades six through eight because the school itself will not open until November. There was a delay uh, with the construction. Our families um, of students who will be going to that school have been informed of that. And we've had several community meetings uh, with that community keeping them updated on the opening. So for six through eight only, our autism program will open there. Those students will be coming from Isaac Gordine's autism program, which um, that school uh, will be closing. And then we'll add our grades K through five for school year 24-25. We did not wanna move um, our students from another elementary school um, to Colin Powell in the middle of the year. So we're only moving those students who would have been at Isaac Gordine, who the entire school will be moving to Colin Powell. We also, we, we opening up a new autism program at Drew Freeman uh, Middle School, which is a new school that, um, not a new school, but a school that's being rebuilt. Um, and we will have an autism program there. Those students that will be going to Drew Freeman will be coming out of Kenmore Middle. Um, not the entire um, program for Kenmore Middle. We have roughly 150 students in the autism program at Kenmore. Um, and so we will be about a third of those students will be going to Drew Freeman based on the boundary changes. Um, another third of the students will be going to Hyattsville Middle School. They will also have a new autism program as well for next school year. And then Kenmore Middle School is being um, rebuilt. They will have autism and our social emotional academic development program for next school year when they open. And then our new uh, uh, Sonia Sotomayor Middle School uh, will have our regional program. And you'll hear a little bit more about where those students are coming from, which will be James um, E. Duck for the regional school. Walker Mill Middle School will have our SEED program, will be at Walker Mill uh, Middle School, and those students will be coming from Isaac Gordine Middle, where we're actually closing that school. So the autism program from Isaac Gordine will be going to the new Colin Powell Academy, and then the SEED program will be going to Walker Mill Middle School. Some other program changes I want to share with you is that the autism program at Paint Branch Elementary will officially close at the end of the 22-23 school year. So we will no longer have an autism program at Paint Branch Elementary. Um, students will go to one of the following autism programs that I have listed here. Um, so we opened up Bladensburg, Bladensburg Elementary, Greenbelt and Rosa Parks about two years ago. And uh, Edward Felogy will be a new program opening for the 22-23 school year. Um, we also are closing our parent infant program at Kingsford Elementary. That program is for uh, students typically two to four that are part of our preschool program for students who are deaf and hard of hearing. We're going to transition the PIP program to Doswell Brooks Elementary, where we already have our school age elementary deaf and hard of hearing program. That way students will have a seamless transition if they're in our PIP program they can transition right to our deaf and hard of hearing program at Doswell Brooks. Uh, the other program change we have is our social emotional academic development program. 
that's currently at North Forestville will close at the end of the 22-23 school year. And that program will be relocated to Francis Scott Key Elementary beginning in the 23-24 school year. Again, our students um, from James E. Duckworth were only the middle school students from grades six through eight will be relocated to our new middle school um, called uh, Sonia Sotomayor uh, beginning next school year. And then our last update I wanted to provide with you um, is that we will have a new special ed early childhood program at Poor Rice Elementary uh, beginning next year. Our teams are busy working. There's already been several transition meetings with all the changes that I've just shared with you. Um, we are having transition meetings with those principals, school teams. If there is, for example, Drew Freeman at Hyattsville who currently does not have an autism program, we are doing staff training, calibration with those staff, just to make sure they understand the students that will be coming to their school and making sure they understand, you know, their learner characteristics, what they may see, what they may hear. Um, from our um, student population. Um, we also are assisting with any type of classroom setup at our new sites. So we have a schedule, a transition schedule, where central office teams will also be assisting with setting up classrooms just to make it easy for our teachers who are transitioning or new teachers that will be hired for those programs. So I did wanna share that with you. And so those meetings um, are going well. As you know, Prince George's County had a huge boundary change initiative that had been worked on for several years that was approved in November by our Board of Education. So families have already received the letters for all of the changes that I just went over with you tonight. Those parents um, have received those letters. And then again, we're continuing to hold transition meetings with those principals and school teams um, to help in that transition process where new programs are op opening or where there's a relocation. Again, this is my contact information. If there's any specific questions after we leave tonight um, that you may have, please feel free to reach out. And Sarah has her hand raised, so I'm going to acknowledge Sarah Whalen. Yeah, could you just tell me a little bit about um, the Social Emotional Academic Development Program? I actually didn't know about it. I'm embarrassed. So, to say. No, so actually we renamed, it used to be called, formally called the Transition Programs. Oh. Across the dis district, we renamed them to the SEED or Social Emotional Academic Development, just because we a lot of times sometimes had a confusion between transition planning that starts at 14 and the transition programs. Um, so they were formally called the transition programs, which are programs for students with emotional um, or social disabilities, where we support them, you know, um, in self-regulation. They have counseling services. A lot of the students have behavior intervention plans. Um, and so we've had those program um, probably since the 70s, I believe, in our district. They opened up back in the 70s. Does that help, Sarah? It was just a name change. Does that answer your question, Sarah? All right, hey, Turner, I have a question. So. Oh, We've got a lot of got a lot of programs that are opening up. So I'm a, I'm going to assume that the plans have been put in place for all the transitions. Like the so we have the students that are moving from one program school to another program school, correct? Yes, and those families have received letters from our school boundaries office, letting them know of that change. Okay, are those students? Is there anything in the works um, in terms of? I don't know, maybe some sort of tour for those students? Is that going to happen? Or Yes, that... great okay. question. That's a great question. So as part of that transition, um, we are working with our principals to actually have a transition day where students could come in ahead of time. We're also doing social stories, particularly for our students in the autism program, just to show them their new school. This is what it's going to look like. Um, these are the folks that you may see, you know, um, just so that they have some understanding and familiarity with who they what they may encounter, but then there will also be an opportunity this summer um, for our students to actually be able to go and set up appointments to go toward the schools once they can actually open. Um, I believe that principals will get keys out around, I wanna say mid-July to August 1st for our new school. So once that hope happens, they have that opportunity. And then for our Colin Powell Academy, that is part of that transition plan to allow students to go over prior to the um, um, 
uh, opening, which will happen in November, and they're opening after Thanksgiving break. So they have an opportunity probably the week before, like that Monday and Tuesday, before we get out for Thanksgiving to be able to go over to the new school. So that's part of the required activities that we are making sure is available to our families and students. Okay, Ms. Bullock has a question, Ms. Bullock. Quick question, are the staff moving with them or will it be all new staff? So part of what happens is um, the Department of Human Resources will work with those um, staff members to make offerings. So they have the choice to either move or to make a choice to go to another school, another program. So the children won't know if they're gonna have familiar With the exception of, so Colin Powell is different because when the school opens, they're actually opening two. So Potomac Landing Elementary and Isaac Gordine Middle School are the two schools that will make up Colin Powell Academy. So when schools actually open, those staff will be in place. And when we move in November, everybody will be intact and move together. Whereas the other new schools um, that are opening is still the same thing. So like Drew Freeman is existing, um, Hyattsville is existing. So if those staff have elected to stay at those schools, they would just move to the new school. It okay. would only be um, so, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, where that is a brand new school that we don't have exist an existing school for, if that makes sense. So we will have a, a you know, process that will be followed with HR to make sure that those positions are filled. Ms. Bullock, Ms. Bullock, you stole my question because I was going to ask that no, question. That's a great myself. question. And they okay. will be naming um, the principal of Colin Powell Academy and uh, Sonia Sodeman Yor, I'm sure pretty soon. We have held those interviews. They were held at the end of March. So we expect to have an announcement at any moment of who those principals will be. So. Okay. So the la one, one last question um, I have is, um, did the students get during the school year uh, up till now, did they get some sort of, um, other than the letters going out, did, did the school do any presentations or special sessions in the school with the kids to talk about this transition? Yes, so there's been ongoing communication through the school, sharing of the blueprints. This is what's gonna happen. This is gonna be the new location of the school. Um, so even before the formal letters went out, we've definitely been pushing it through our PGCPS newsletter, listserv, principal has been sending uh, communication out with the anticipated move dates, all of that information. So there's been ongoing communication. Each new school also hosted uh, community nights, parent nights to, get, to give more information about construction updates, transition dates, that type of thing. So we've been held in meetings kind of ongoing throughout the school year. Okay. Great All questions. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Bowman. So now we're going to transition into our guest speaker. Um, our guest speaker is Noor Perez. He is the Community Engagement Manager with the Autism Self Advocacy Network. He is a student activist turned autism and LGBT plus community organizer, storyteller, public speaker, and internet researcher. Uh, he focuses on the intersections of disability, gender, identity, sexuality, and religion. And we want to welcome Noah Perez to share with us information. And uh, it, the title I put in the agenda was The Perfect Time to Learn About the Autistic self Advocacy <laughs> Network. So welcome, Noah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, would it be possible to let me screen share? You should be able to now. There we go. Sweet. Okay. I'm going to switch that over. Hooray. All right. And I apologize if you can hear the slight snorting next to me. I've got a very adorable, very eager beagle who is sitting here and staring at me. <laughs> but hello, everyone. Thank you for, for joining me on that, that, that camera upload. There we go. <laughs> For joining me on this late Tuesday evening. Um, my, my name is Noor. I'm with the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, and I am the Community Engagement Manager, which is a fancy way of saying that my special interest is people, and I get paid to work with people for a living. And I am very happy about that. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, this is basically where for the next like 45 minutes, I just kind of monologue at you about the story of how we came to be and what we do now. And I'm gonna go through some of our priorities, some of the things we do, and then I'll take you through some parts of our website to kind of show you examples of those things as they come up. So the place that I always like to start when I'm having this conversation, who are we actually? So the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network is a nonprofit who does policy advocacy. We are based out of Washington, DC, but we work nationally and we have been in this area for a solid, God, just over a decade at this point. But I always really love to tell this story because whenever people like, there's the barking, <laughs> whenever folks typically are introduced to the org, we often get people who think that we started out as like some really big national thing that just came out of the ether. And the reality of the thing is that ASAN actually came about as an extension of a very long and very storied process around the self-advocacy movement and literally started, I kid you not, as three separate people in three separate states who met each other or through, through very nerdy means on three separate working laptops for the first several years of its life. So from small beginnings, a lot has grown. Um, <laughs> Um, so if we try to kind of work our way back here, um, looking at the self-advocacy movement, so self-advocacy in this case, pointing specifically at the communities of people with disabilities who have intellectual disabilities and people who have developmental disabilities, including autism, um, there is a fairly recent point within the last hundred years where people with disabilities and particularly kids with disabilities, the expectation was that if your kid was diagnosed with, with certain sets of conditions that they'd be placed in a nursing home or an institution and that they would grow up away from their parents, away from their family in kind of these separate bubbles. And institutions as they existed and as they still exist by virtue of being out of sight and out of mind are hotbeds of abuse and harmed a lot of people and still do. Um, and shortly after kind of an outpouring of civil rights movements around like, I would say, depending on what time frame you're looking at for which groups of people, the disability rights movement really started hitting its peak right around like the late 60s, early 70s, depending on what parts of the country you're looking in. And around that time, we also had a push towards deinstitutionalization and for people with disabilities and our families to be able to live out in society, out in the world and to grow up at home with people that love us and to be able to be a part of society. And there's a lot of stuff that has more press around the independent living half of the movement. So things like the 504 sit-ins, the Capitol crawl, all of the work that came towards the ADA, yeah, all of which is critically important and did include people that have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, but around that same time, as you have kind of this lynch point where more and more people are being able to grow up at home, you start getting these waves and waves and waves of conferences where parents of kids with disabilities, particularly parents of IDD and intellectually and developmentally disabled kids are coming and meeting each other for the first time and they're bringing their kids. And they're doing that over periods of years and their kids are getting older and they're meeting each other. You see where this is going and they're making friends and they're building culture and they're talking to each other. And it's in that way that we started to see more of kind of an understanding within the autistic community in particular 
of kind of autistic community norms, things like that a lot of autistic people, for example, might flap our hands or that we might have differences in volume and tone and control, but also things that were internal and inherent to the way that we kind of operate. The way that I tend to give people like the framework here is that we're a bunch of Macs going around in a PC-based operating system world, right? There's nothing wrong. We're just a different set of principles. We're operating on a different wavelength. And meeting each other for that first time was the chance that we had as a group of people to be able to kind of start thinking, hey, what are we missing? What are the things that other people get to do that we don't get to do? And from that, you get this growing outpouring of people within developmental disability circles in general, but also autistic people in specific going, I want to have the, my own choices. I want to make choices about where I can work, where I can go to school. I want to make choices about where I can live and who I can live with. And I want to have choices about what I get to do and how I get to spend my time when I become an adult. And out of that outgrowth, out of those meetings came the marches and the advocacy and the group meetings that would eventually, 10 years later, bring together three separate friends from an online <laughs> in fiction writing site all of whom were autistic and all of whom had a lot of really intense policy nerdy things that they had to say about the ways that autistic people were treated at a national level. And from that came ASAN. We started out in three separate states on a bunch of laptops. And then over about 10 years, folks worked on grants and funding and et cetera, moved to DC, got offices, coalesced into a C3 yeah, and hired lawyers and began working on policy. So really from the ground up, we were made by autistic people with the intent of being able to serve the needs of our community and also to, by extension, serve the needs of the larger disability community because autistic people are everywhere and we can have lots of other disabilities too. And by that same standard, we have lots of people that love us and we want to have our supporters have a place that they can kind of come and learn from our community and our history and do share together. So that's a very big and very sappy way of me starting that conversation. Specifically to basically go, what do we care about? <laughs> so some of the priorities we have. <laughs> um, ASAN as a policy organization centers the idea that all autistic people deserve the right to live freely in our own communities, to make our own choices, and to advocate for ourselves and for our communities. As part of that, we talk about home and community-based services, which is a very... I did not ask for you, Siri. <laughs> Which is check it out. Which is a yeah longer phrase term, but basically just here to say for autistic folks and for people with disabilities in general. One moment, I apologize. To be able to live at home. Basically, HCBS are the resources that allow us to get what, the things that we need to complete what are called adult daily living skills. So that's things like being able to get out of bed, get dressed, take your medicine, and have regular meals, and be able to do what you need to, to kind of make it through your day. Um, Different people have different kinds of support needs, and we always make it a point to point out the fact that like someone being really good at specific parts of functioning in a way that looks from the outside in 
like someone who is not autistic does not point to someone having or not having a set of support needs in and of itself. For example, we talk a lot about the fact that everyone communicates and that just because someone, for example, might not use verbal speech, that doesn't mean that that person is inherently going to have any given support need. They don't come as a package. It's more kind of like a salad bar. People have lots of different things that they need supports with and that they might be doing better or worse with on a given day. And like with anything and like with all people that can shift over time with factors like aging, trauma, and getting sort of pushed and pulled by the tides of life, getting into new and different situations. Um, we also advocate for ending the school to prison pipeline, which is the research phenomenon of excessive punishment of students of color, particularly students of color with disabilities. Um, we advocate for communication supports. So access to AAC. So if you've seen you know, like talkers or iPads that people will sometimes use to communicate, it, that is one of the things that we advocate for, as well as giving people access to whatever types of occupational or speech therapy supports that people individually might need or want, and access to really the idea that at a broad level, everyone has a right to communicate, and that whatever tools they need to be able to do so, oh, that we need to kind of be advocating to bridge that gap rather than trying to push speech above all else, but rather trying to focus on communicating with the person, figuring out what they want and what they need and to go from there. We also push for what we call community-based participatory research, which is a $10 way of basically saying, if you're researching autistic people and the autistic community, start by including us from the ground up, including when you're asking your question. Seems fairly straightforward. If you want to benefit a community, it's really great to ask them what they need. And that's basically where that comes from. Alrighty. And so from that, the fun part, what do we do? <laughs> so examples of things that we work on. So we're gonna go through these individually on the website, but we make resources in plain language and easy read, which can be a little bit weird to explain, but I will flip through these tabs, show you as soon as I can actually see them. There we go. So for example, we have a toolkit about the Americans with Disabilities Act and the history of that. And it goes through sort of the history of the ADA, why it was made, why it's important, and how it's relevant today, and ways that it has been sort of changed and added to over time. And we make that toolkit available in two versions one of which is our easy read. So easy read is basically designed to be read at a lower reading grade level, but to convey the same amount of information and the same amount of detail. So the idea here is that things have more spacing and they introduce ideas very much one piece at a time and directly link the information along with picture supports so that folks can get the same info, but kind of follow the train of thought very clearly. We found that this is particularly helpful for folks who might still be a kind of, who might for various reasons be navigating like learning English as a second language or for folks who might have processing difficulty as well as people with intellectual disabilities. We also have a version that is easy read, that it, apologies, that is plain language, which is written for a slightly higher grade level, but still pitched around, I would say, fifth or sixth grade. So more straightforward, 
record, but less breaking it down into every single individual sentence and more kind of short paragraphs to explain the same information. Other things that we care about. So we also host ACI, which is our Autism Campus Inclusion Leadership Seminar. That is our program for college students, which happens once a year. And during the pandemic has been continuing to happen virtually. Um, it essentially is a leadership academy that talks students through what what it takes to make a self-advocacy group on their campus. And we also teach them a lot about disability history, smart goal setting, and in general about relationship building and kind of networking and strategy around trying to build sort of momentum behind an activism movement. Um, we have applications go out about once a year. And that is definitely you know, one of those things that is further in the future, depending on how young the kid in question is. But it's always it's been really exciting to kind of have available for folks to kind of look to, particularly I've noticed for people who are still kind of navigating the thought process of like, when I get to college, will I be able to find other people like me who are interested in learning about disability history, who have the same conditions, who are in the same general realm of experience. And it can be kind of cool to go like, yes, you are not the only one who has a special interest in this realm of things. <laughs> but yes, and um, for clarity's sake, we also make it a point to specify that while they need to be, while students that enter the program have to be in what we consider like a post-secondary program, it doesn't have to be a traditional college setting. Uh, TIPSIDs or vocational schools, trade schools, anything that serves as kind of a transition period for folks kind of going from transition age years, so around the 18s, early 20s, into that realm, can absolutely do that, as well as folks who are older and entering school again, as long as they are or, um, still within the program and have at least one year left um, on campus. And along that line, we also who are advocates for policies that benefit the disability community on the Hill and in the media. So one way that we make some of our policy goals visible to folks is with an issue tracker. So basically we kind of group the policies that we're advocating for into kind of subgroups with explainers so that folks can learn more about specific legislation that we're looking at as well as kind of the background for all of those issues. So for example, one of the things that we talk about a lot is the right to make choices, which is advocating for self-determination. So basically individual people being able to make choices with supporters. So for example, well, if you have support needs in a given area and might need additional help, trying to fully kind of grasp all the nuances on an issue, having the legal right to bring a supporter into a setting like, for example, well, a leasing office to help you ask questions and gain full information before you, the individual person signing a lease, make your final choice. Um, so as part of that, we have kind of like an introduction to the idea, a basic overview, and then a link to any outside resources, both from us and outside orgs, so that people have access to toolkits and other ways to learn about the given issue.
And we also work on joint campaigns and issues impacting hangout community. So for example, one of the current pushes on the Hill is talking about trying to make sure that at, um, Medicaid, it gets to continue to exist in its current form without cuts or caps. That would be an example where we might be working in coalition with other disability organizations to talk about the impacts that we have seen at the policy end around Medicaid. So why does all of this matter? Basically, um, the reason why I tend, why I've kind of gone through all of this and to kind of highlight all of this is that at a fundamental level, if a given issue impacts our community, our community being the autistic community and all of the folks that love us, it deserves our attention and our input. And because as my friend Liz Weintraub, who is an amazing advocate over at AUCD, says, because all means all. So I want to spend a second kind of marinating on that because it's a point that often can kind of get lost in the conversation. But when I say all means all, and when Liz says all means all, she always emphasizes that particularly as someone who has a developmental disability and in Liz's case, also an intellectual disability, yeah, um, there's frequently this assumption that only certain types of people can care about the issues that impact our lives or that only certain kinds of people can advocate or learn or understand about these issues. And fundamentally, at a basic level, my job and the job of the people that I work with is to tear that idea down from its base. Anyone who wants to understand more about kind of the infrastructure that built disability advocacy and that built the rights that we have deserves to get to do so and deserves to do so on their terms. And if they want to learn about policies that are currently happening, they deserve to have that information available to them in plain language so that they are able to make their own choices about how they want to talk about it, both in their community and if they want to advocate for it, right in a policy setting, how they want to approach that on the Hill or with their local representatives. And we have tools for that as well. So what, yeah, when, when we say that, we do in fact mean people who might have processing difficulties, people who might not use verbal speech, people who might move slowly, people who might present a variety of ways on any given day, and people from a variety of backgrounds and gender identities and races and classes and all of the things. We genuinely do mean that all autistic people deserve that access. So that's kind of the realm from which I speak to y'all today um, and kind of how I tend to speak from that. Um, so in terms of ways to support or get involved, um, folks should definitely feel free to poke around our website and get access to resources. I will also put my email up in the chat in just a moment so that folks have that as well. I also do have one more website to plug here. Acceptance.com. There we go. Um, one resource that I do want to let people know is just out there for free and is available for anyone to read. Um, at autismacceptance.com, we have an online version of Welcome to the Autistic Community, which is a guide that was written entirely by autistic people to talk about um, to talk about a variety of things, but mostly about autism, what it is, information for people who might be learning about it for the first time and are trying to figure out how to be allies, 
information for parents and professionals and for people in the media who might be looking for more respectful language. Um, but yeah, we have that available and we also have link outs to other places around the web that have blogs from autistic people from lots of different perspectives, lots of different backgrounds. So if you're looking for places to kind of get started with finding more readings from the community, that is also a place to start. And on our website in the top right corner, we do also have a tab that says get involved that talks about different volunteering opportunities and places to contact us. So that is also out there. Um, and one pet project that I always try to plug when I am at a presentation, um, we do have something called a proxy caller system, which is basically where if someone wants to put in a call to their representative, but for whatever disability related reason doesn't feel comfortable using the phone, um, they can submit a script basically saying, my name is insert name here, my representative is, and they can select their representative, and I want to talk to them about, and then it's just a wide open text box, and they can just tell us basically what they want to tell them. Um, and we have volunteers who phone bank for us that take those scripts, call on their behalf, and they have a script that is auto-generated that basically says, hi, my name is blank, and I am speaking on behalf of blank person and who is represented by insert representative here. <laughs> here is what they have to say. If you have further information you'd like to communicate with them directly, here's the contact information they've provided, and they leave that as a voicemail. So if you or anyone you know is really good at phone calls, which is not frequently the apple of my eye or many of my friends' eyes, that is one of the volunteer opportunities that we have among kind of the smorgasbord. 